Uh, thank you all uh, for being here today. It is a great honor and privilege to be introducing this panel. And I am very pleased to open the conversation about the importance of global diversity, inclusiveness, and multilateralism for space security. To address these topics, I am very happy to be joined by four remarkable experts. To start with, we are joining us virtually Noel Riza Castillo, who is the director of the Space Policy and International Cooperation Bureau of the Philippine Space Agency. She is a lawyer by profession with a background in economics. As the Space Agency Director, she handles international space law, principles, developments, and provides legal services to the agency. She is also in charge of harnessing international cooperation relationship. Ms. Castillo represents the Philippines as a delegate to the COPIOS, the OEWG on reducing space threats through norms, rules, and principles of responsible behaviors and other space-related conferences. She will also be part of the group of governmental experts tasked to consider and make recommendations on substantial elements of an internationally legally binding instrument on the prevention of an arms race in outer space. André Nongierma is currently the chief of the geospatial information section at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. He oversees the ECA's work in advancing holistic geospatial information management strategies and governance and providing assistance to African countries and regional entities in the development or an implementation of spatial information infrastructure. Pascal Leguet is a French Air and Space Force officer. He acquired experience mainly in the field of geography, imagery, international relations, space and security issues. He has been appointed to the European Space Agency in 2019, first as a senior security advisor to the European Space Agency, Earth Observation Director, and as a senior security coordinator to ESA DG since 2021. He has a PhD in international relations and a law degree. Last but not least, Romina Morello is the ICRC representative. She is working in the field of international humanitarian law, and she is an Argentinian qualified lawyer with an LLM in public international law from Leiden University. She currently works as regional legal advisor for the Americas for the ICRC, and in this position, she coordinates the legal advisors of the continent to promote IHL. So as you can see, we have an amazing set of experts and we are very looking forward to hear what they have to tell us today. I am really very honored to be moderating this panel. To start the discussion, the panelists offer their initial remarks on the topic and then we will move to a period of moderated discussions. I will be asking some questions in my capacity of moderator, but we are very keen to provide the audience with the opportunity to ask questions. Mr. Leguet, I will give you the floor now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Leticia. And also, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Unidir and uh, Cecile, for this uh, invitation uh, to, uh, to speak today. So um, one important point for me uh, to start this, uh, uh, my initial remarks is to, to say about ESA, the European Space Agency. Uh, it's an intergovernmental uh, organization uh, with uh, 22 member states. Uh, an important aspect is the fact it's a, a civilian uh, research and development organization. So the fundamental uh, objective uh, is uh, to achieve a PAROS, and uh, Leticia, you said the PAROS, prevention of uh, an arms race in outer space. So we, we know that uh, outer space is a, a common good of uh, humanity. And preserving this, uh, this, uh, this property it's a, a collective responsibility at national level, at regional level, and of course at international level. But first of all, I would like to, uh, to present the, the, the space context today uh, to uh, give you uh, my view concerning this uh, today's situation in space. And for me, we have uh, three main aspects. Uh, the first one is the multiplication of uh, actors. More and more, we have uh, uh, many different actors acting in space. Of course, we have the states, 
we have uh, uh, groups of uh, states and ESA, the European Space Agency is, uh, if I can put it like that, a good example of uh, a group of, of states acting uh, in, uh, in space. But also we have uh, uh, more and more private actors also leading some activities in space. We, we can uh, come back on this uh, later on. And also individuals. It's possible for a citizen, uh, I would say a normal citizen, to... Uh, to be a tourist in space, uh, if you have a, a big amount of money, it's possible, and to have access to uh, uh, multiple space services. So uh, individuals are also uh, an important actor in this uh, space context. So it was the first aspect, multiplication of actors. The second one is uh, the technological evolution and development. Today, uh, technology enables, uh, I would say, everything. Uh, it's possible to deflect uh, an asteroid. Uh, NASA is working on this, uh, on this important uh, topic. Uh, ESA in the past also, uh, it was possible for, uh, to place a vehicle on the surface of a comet. For me, it's a fantastic te technological challenge. So uh, technology uh, is not an obstacle. I would say the limit is uh, the political and budget uh, priority or priorities. The third aspect to me is the evolution of interest and threats uh, in outer space. So uh, you know that today uh, one of the big challenges is to go back uh, to, to the moon and there is a, a big uh, energy impetus to, to, to go back to, uh, for a, a moon mission. Uh, different uh, uh, nations are involved in this uh, uh, challenge. Then a mission to Mars is the next step, and beyond uh, the distance exploration of the universe. So we can uh, we can speak about, uh, if, if uh, I can put it like that, colonization of uh, space, uh, step by step, the opening of uh, new frontiers. There is also this uh, important question uh, concerning the exploitation and use of mining and energy resources. This, this point is, uh, this uh, important question is raised, and it so is a part of this, uh, of this context. Also, considering the threats, we have uh, uh, more and more activities in space. Uh, that means also uh, more and more risks and threats. And yesterday, um, if I'm not wrong, there was a dedicated panel for the threats in, uh, in uh, outer space. Uh, to mention, uh, again, uh, uh, debris, uh, space weather, uh, cyber attacks, uh, espionage between satellites, jamming, anti-satellite fire, kinetic actions, uh, and physical uh, actions against uh, uh, space infrastructure. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is a, a just a summary of some of them, of, the, of these uh, uh, threats. So to summarize the, the today's situation in space, multiplication of actors, technological development, and the evolution of interests and threats in outer space. From this uh, current uh, situation, and to answer the question you, you, ra uh, you raised at the beginning, uh, Leticia, about the importance of global diversity, inclusiveness, and multilateralism for space security, there are two dimensions to take into account. Uh, an important one, I would say the first one, is the legal dimension, and probably my, my colleague will elaborate on this uh, legal aspect. With this uh, very important question, is current space law sufficient or should we develop it? This is a, a first point. Uh, another question is, uh, should this uh, space law be binding or non-binding? And different speakers uh, the, the, in the other panels uh, also underline this uh, binding versus non-binding uh, aspects of the, of the space law to regulate activities in space. Concerning also the, uh, I said we have more and more objects in orbit, and there is this uh, other point, uh, other issue concerning the space traffic management, STM. We have today uh, an air traffic management, it's normal, we have many uh, planes uh, uh, every day uh, in the uh, atmosphere, uh, atmospheric part of the, of the Earth. For outer space, the same question. And the question is how to implement this uh, space traffic management. So the evolution of the law can take place at national level. And we have uh, also different examples today with uh, uh, countries uh, also uh, defining their, uh, I would say, their own uh, space law. Uh, it's a 
a trend uh, today. We have also regional actors concerning uh, the evolution of the law, space law. Europe is a good example. Uh, just to mention this a code of conduct for outer space activities. It was an initiative in uh, 2013-14, uh, still pending, uh, no, uh, no conclusion at the moment for, for this, but uh, a proposal. And of course, we have the international level for the, the space law and the United Nations is, the, uh, of course, the, 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 the perfect uh, uh, level for this. So I mentioned this uh, legal dimension. Another important dimension is the, the cooperation dimension. Uh, and when we speak about cooperation, that immediately means competition. We have cooperation versus competition. So we have domains where uh, we can cooperate uh, when we speak about the human flights. The International Space Station is a good example of this uh, very uh, constructive cooperation uh, between the different uh, nations. Exploration, science uh, in general, are also good topics of uh, cooperation. But we have also areas uh, with uh, strong uh, and, uh, I can say, uh, fierce competition. Uh, because they are political, economic, strategic, commercial, and uh, therefore profit interest. And just to mention the Earth observation activities, the positioning, navigation, timing uh, as well. Telecommunications are domains where we have uh, competition, at least at commercial level. In conclusion, uh, uh, just to say that the greatest risk is to transpose the terrestrial tensions and conflicts into outer space. This is the main risk. We can avoid it uh, thanks uh, to our diversity, which is an asset, of course, through inclusiveness by leaving no one behind, and through multi multilateralism with balanced agreements between nations. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Major Leguet, for uh, these very interesting thoughts, and uh, especially because of your experience with the European Space Agency, you really like managed to catch the interest of cooperation, multiplication of actors, variety of technology. And, you know, you mentioned some terms, and they are also being discussed and defined, and this is particularly true for space exploration, for instance, the notion of colonizing, and some people are using for the human presence on celestial bodies different terms. Having said that, I will give the floor now to Mr. Nongirma. I know that you really have this broad overview of space activities, the different uh, facets, you know, the, the policy, the science, the economical aspects, but also the human part. So you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leticia, for um, the warm welcome. And um, thank you to the organizer for the opportunity to speak to this uh, uh, panel. Uh, we just hear from the previous speaker that uh, we are um, seeing a lot of actors coming in the, in the space arena and uh, Africa is not uh, left behind in that science uh, because we have been witnessing in the last uh, couple of decades that uh, space capacity is improving in, in, in Africa with many nations in the process of establishing their own space related capability and programs and building uh, institution to manage the uh, program. And of course, it's uh, axiomatic to say that uh, space technology is very relevant and, and critical to Africa development agenda because uh, utilization of Earth observation can help African policymakers strengthen their decision-making processes and, and formulate uh, sound development policies. Although the, all these efforts at national, regional, continental, and global uh, level require legal instruments to, uh, to be put in place, such as legally bending international treaties, laws and regulations that are all important to ensure responsibility, uh, accountability, and ethical and peaceful use of our common outer space. It's critically important uh, from where we are sitting to, to note that we need what I call uh, space justice or uh, space for now that can ensure that uh, space science and technology provides social and economic <laughs> benefit for, for all uh, 
uh, in an inclusive manner. There are four, four aspects I wanted to underscore here uh, from the African context and for us to achieving global diversity, inclusiveness and multilateralism for space security for all. Uh, first, the first one is how do we bridge the space divide? It's uh, obvious that uh, uh, some of the pioneer nations have gotten uh, tremendous experience uh, over years uh, in the space arena. And those who are starting the process need also to catch up and, and, and be able to uh, build their own space related needs, but also ensuring that they promote legal and policy framework that uh, um, enable uh, the development of space capability uh, within their society. And of course, uh, we need a strong support for uh, this emerging space sparing nation to revise or to develop their uh, national space laws and policy to be in line with uh, the international normative frameworks applicable to outer space activity. The second aspect is that uh, law and policy, and uh, this was also mentioned uh, by the previous speaker, uh, vary greatly between countries. Uh, for instance, we have uh, 50, 55 countries in Africa, and each nation may require different legal and policy framework uh, as each nation may have, will have, is unique legal system, institutions, history, and cultural and societal norms. As a result, uh, the relative importance of each legal element will vary between, between country. Therefore, I believe that when deciding upon a legal and policy framework for a nation is uh, critically important to understand the respective strength and weakness of each element when uh, developing the appropriate legal and policy framework. The third aspect I'm seeing is about uh, how do we enforce some of the legal instruments for space security. Uh, policy and norms are uh, pretty easier to develop and introduce, but it can be difficult to, to, to enforce. Uh, for example, um, the elements of a legal and policy framework that enable space development may include laws and, 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 and regulation. These may be legally enforceable across a, a, an entire nation, across a region, and also globally, but can take a long time to develop and, and come into effect, especially when we are uh, looking at the global aspect of, uh, of it. Another aspect, the fourth element I want to underscore is the, the all inclusiveness. Of course, um, there is a tendency to slowly, uh, solidly think about national laws and policy uh, when considering legal and uh, policy framework for space. But it's, uh, important to um, also recognize that a legal and policy framework that support space programs, especially space security, must extend beyond national or uh, federal laws and, and, and policy. And of course, there are many, uh, in your introduction, Leticia, you have mentioned many international, regional or local law and policy that can be considered. And uh, of course, um, those international treaties and regional agreement can impact a, a country space program as can a city data uh, policy, for instance. So similarly, I believe that um, uh, all such agreement will impact the space program 
speaking at uh, at uh, at uh, national level and also when we consider the development of uh, a legal and policy framework for space security for space development it's also important to consider that uh, at least at the national level the national space ecosystem consists of more than just the government because we have uh, of course, the government agency, but we also have industry, citizen, non-government organizations, and academia, and all of them play a, a crucial roles in, 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 in that. Some are both uh, just space producer and space program users, but it can happen that uh, they are both program producer and uh, program user. Therefore, we need to to remember that a law or a policy that restrict the ability of one part of this ecosystem to collect, use uh, space related asset will invariably have an impact uh, on the other part uh, of the ecosystem, uh, particularly on the on the space uh, security. I can elaborate uh, later on 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 this. And finally, and this is uh, the, the fifth and last aspect I wanted to, to highlight uh, now uh, is about the sustainability of space security. And we understand that uh, legal and policy frameworks for space um, do not operate in a vacuum, either nationally or at, at the global level, and we have been recalled since yesterday that uh, UN USA, QPOS, even ITU have long developed a checklist of uh, legal and uh, regulatory concern on space, and 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 and, and they provide uh, a checklist of uh, specific legal and regulatory issue to track when uh, to take into consideration when planning and executing a a, a space program, but is. It's obvious that uh, such frameworks need to be continuously updated to keep pace with the technological and other advancement. And my sense is that this is only the way we can ensure sustainability and up-to-date legal and policy framework that, that remain uh, valid and and, and 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 useful for for the community. Uh, over the the century, of course, um, billions of people have tried many things. Uh, Sometimes they have found new solutions, and we get, as we see today, to inherit uh, from from their uh, uh, historical work. So um, we are not at this point in time uh, smart by our individual genius, but from our collective uh, knowledge accumulated over time. And uh, maybe this is where we need to collectively act to ensure that uh, no one is left behind at the global level and also within nation and this is the only way we can ensure that we have uh, a, sustainable, a sustainable use of uh, space uh, uh, for good for, 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 for all. Thank you so much, and uh, I submit. Thank you, Mr. Nongyama, for this introductory remarks. It's indeed a very interesting to hear you speak about these notions of ethics and responsibility, you know, because they are very much interpreted differently. I believe that if I ask every single person in this room what is ethical use or ethical exploration in outer space, I will have as many answers as there are people in the room, right? And this is why we need this diverse view. And as you just very rightly said, we need to make sure that all of the different perspectives are uh, taken into consideration. And indeed, we need to, to adopt this regional approach because it's very important to first uh, get this common understanding among different states that are from the same region. Uh, this, is, this will be you know, this top-down way 
of working and of course the, the bottom-up approach at the international level. And to speak about these different notions, I will now give the floor to Noel Castillo to provide us with her initial remarks. Thank you, Leticia. Good evening, everyone from the Philippines. Thank you, Unidir, for having me at this conference to join the discussion on a topic that concerns us all, space security. It's a privilege to be among my esteemed co-panelists tonight from the Philippines. And as the title of this panel suggests, panelists from globally diverse backgrounds, depending on our national situations and experiences, interests, history, and capabilities. In my part of the globe, particularly, we are an archipelagic state composed of some 7,640 islands. We are situated near the equator and surrounded by seas, some parts of which are contested by our neighbors. We see the issue of space security with a lens coming from these territorial challenges, our cultural richness, our economic situation, our technological advancements, and other characteristics that are uniquely ours. As an emerging space-capable nation with limited space assets, we attach great importance to the harnessing of space resources as being intimately connected to economic development and the issue of national security. So with such characteristics as ours, with such unique characteristics as ours, I cannot expect any other country to be fully acquainted with our needs and interests regarding space security or any, any national, national interest for that matter. Yet, like all other countries, long-term sustainability of space, safety, and security are also our aspirations. Unless, but unless we are involved in the discussion, other states will not be informed of our needs and experiences. And for this reason, in the recently concluded open-ended working group on reducing space threats by norms, rules, and principles of responsible behaviors in space, we have advocated the international principle of due regard as a foundational principle of responsible behavior in space. Uh, in, uh, in accordance with this principle, we submit that each state must conduct space activities with due regard that they will not prejudice the rights and interests of other states. And also as a country that is near the equator, as I previously mentioned, surrounded by seas, we are a natural flight path for rocket launches and prone to being, unfortunately, prone to being drop zones of space debris. For this reason, again, we have advocated in the recently concluded OEWG as for transparency in space programs, specifically in the issuances of pre and post rocket launch notifications to enable us as a nation to properly respond to threats coming from space launch debris or even uncontrolled re-entry. And with that, we, we, I just want to say as a final word for my initial remarks that we are committed to preserving outer space for peaceful uses, and we are supportive of the discussions in the different platforms with the goal of reaching agreement to reduce space threats without being mutually exclusive. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion tonight. So thank you, Mrs. Castillo. Now I am turning to you for your initial remarks. Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking UNIDIR for organizing this very important conference and for inviting us to be present here today and uh, speak to all of you. As done by the previous panelists, I would like to briefly mention what the International Committee of the Red Cross is. Many of you might know it already. We are an independent and neutral organization ensuring the protection and assistance of victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence. We also uh, promote the respect of international humanitarian law and its implementation in national law. Uh, I'm, I'm here in this panel today because I, I'm the legal advisor for the Americas, so I have been working with a lot of Americas states on uh, this issue of implementation of IHO, uh, which is somehow related as well to the topic that we're going to discuss today. So, despite going much more into uh, the, the specific topic of the panel, I would like to start by saying that despite the long-term desire of international community to explore and use the outer space for peaceful purposes, states' uh, systems have employed for military purposes since the dawn of the space era. 
I think this was already mentioned, Latin America is not a, a, a different example of this. At the beginning, all these um, the technological development institutions started with or associated with the armed forces, even though that gradually changed uh, over the time. It is important to highlight uh, that uh, as the role of space systems in military operations during armed conflict increases, so too does the likelihood of their being targeted with significant risk of harm to civilians and civilian objects on Earth and in space. This is because technology enabled by space systems permeates most aspects of civilian life, making the potential consequences of attacks on space systems a matter of humanitarian concern. However, military operations in outer space do not occur in a legal vacuum. We have discussed before, and, and the panelists before has mentioned that the legal aspect is a very important one for this matter of space security. We consider that they are constrained by existing international law, notably the Outer Space Treaty, the UN Charter, and IHL rules governing means and methods of warfare. Latin American countries were involved in the multilateral discussions of the Committee of the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space since its very inception. Their participation in the negotiations of the five UN treaties contributed to the drafting the final text that currently regulate space activity. In addition, the evolution of COPIUS member membership reflects the considerable increase of Latin America and Caribbean countries that are engaging in space activities and are willing to continue contributing to the global governance of space. In addition, I would like to highlight that the Americas region has great adherence to IHL treaties. For example, from the 28 IHL treaties that we consider the main ones, out of 38 states, three states in the Americas have ratified 100% of them, 13 between 80 and 90%, and four states have ratified more than 75% of these IHL treaties in the region. The question about how existing international law, including IHL, should be interpreted and applied in the context of outer space have prompted extensive work and discussion in multilateral processes and the development of national policies, were mentioned before, doctrines and military manuals, as well as academic initiatives. We as the ICRC uh, have participated and contributed with our expertise to these processes and initiatives based on our humanitarian mission and mandate. Considering that there is disruption, damage, or destruction of space systems serving critical civilian infrastructure and or supporting essential civilian services could have a significant human cost on civilians on Earth and in space, the ICRC made recommendations focusing on measures to minimize such risks. These recommendations were presented this year in two regional events, one organized in Panama City, Panama, at the beginning of the year. The other one um, presented, I think it was one month ago, uh, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where states from South America, Central America, and North America, as well as the Caribbean, met to discuss some of these issues. During these meetings, I, I think it is very important to highlight that many states, as it have happened yesterday and today, uh, express clear opposition to the weaponization of outer space and upheld the objective of preventive, preventing an armed race in outer space as a common objective for the international community. Some even caution against the discussion of applicability of IHL to outer space due to concerns over the possible legitimization of use of force in space or challenges posed by the specificities of the space environment to the application of international law in space. These, of course, are important considerations. However, it was clearly explained in those two regional events that asserting that IHL applies to outer space warfare is not an encouragement to weaponize outer space. Resort to force by state in space as anywhere else always remain governed by the UN Charter and the applicable international law on the use of force. On this basis, the ICRC recommends states to further study and discuss, and I think it was mentioned by a panelist before, on how international law applies in outer space. 
An example of how the region is already contributing to these important discussions can uh, be mentioned because 12 out of 34 states that have reaffirmed in the framework of the open-ended working group, group the application of the existing international law, including IHL to space environment, the protection of critical space-based services to civilian, and the need to address threats of destruction and incapacitation of space objects, which generate derby, were from the Americas. We acknowledge the value of multilateral, global, and regional discussions on space security, in particular in its inclusiveness, which allows awareness raising on the importance of space security for a large number of states and enable them to start contemplating their own state policy. It is also encouraging to see that humanitarian concerns found its place in these multilateral, regional and international processes, and there is a growing common understanding and acceptance with regard to the applicability of international law to outer space and the protection of critical, critical space-based space -based services. Let me finish by saying that the ICRC recommends that, given the increasingly, increasingly indispensable role of space systems in the provision of essential services, civilian services, humanitarian considerations should be one of the cornerstones of any multilateral, whether regional, interregional, or international um, discussions, and of any normative development with regard to space security. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this introductory remarks. And indeed, I am very much looking forward to hear your views uh, during the Q&A session from an American perspective, because it is indeed a very vast continent. And it must have been so interesting to have all of this diversity of view. And another point uh, I haven't mentioned uh, is about multilingualism. The fact that there are so many experts of, you know, which the, the main language is not English, for instance, at this table, I think that none of us has English as the main language, uh, but this is our working language. And the, the multilingualism, the, the expertise we can provide in, in this uh, multilateral fora is uh, essential. So I'm very happy uh, to have all of you around this table uh, today. So. I will uh, now start the uh, moderated uh, discussion. The first question is, how can different regions with diverse space capabilities and priorities foster inter-regional cooperation, ensuring that space security measures are both comprehensive and regionally uh, sensitive? And you touch a bit this uh, topic, but uh, you know, I would love to hear more from a Paros, so the prevention of an outer space in outer space perspective. Uh, what are your views on this? So do you want to start on this point? Pascal? Thanks, Leticia. I mentioned in my uh, preliminary remarks this uh, cooperation aspect. Uh, for me, it's fundamental. First, because uh, uh, I would start with the practical reasons. Uh, space activities are uh, expensive. Uh, so uh, even the big uh, space uh, ferry nations, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, a substantial budget, but it's not enough to cover everything. And uh, in particular, when we speak about the, the moon uh, mission, uh, we need uh, a lot of money. We have some figures we, we, can, we can find. But uh, in, uh, uh, for, for the general activities uh, uh, in space and activities from space, uh, we need also to uh, to uh, develop this uh, cooperation. This uh, cooperation is a way also to uh, uh, to, to to develop uh, transparency. If we cooperate together on uh, different uh, topics, I mentioned exploration, uh, uh, science in uh, in space, also to to use uh, space capacities uh, to support uh, terrestrial uh, activities, to support uh, citizens on a daily basis. It's important to be together. Uh, to mention André, uh, also in uh, his speech, uh, mentioned this uh, the African uh, strong dynamism in terms of cooperation. And uh, it's, it's the case. We have uh, ISA, the Urban Space Agency, is connected, uh, connected has uh, strong relations with, uh, with Africa. And today we, we see more and more national space agencies in Africa. Uh, we have uh, f uh, 55 countries, but also the, uh, we have this uh, new African Space Agency. It shows that we have uh, this, uh, this need to work together 
uh, so at uh, continental regional level uh, first. And then we have the, 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 the necessary weight to also uh, cooperate with the other continents, uh, other regions uh, to, uh, to, uh, to promote uh, a peaceful use of, uh, of uh, space uh, uh, capacities. Um, what is important also to, you, you said it at the beginning, I think, uh, Leticia, is the fact that uh, we have, of course, uh, different levels of uh, technology, of uh, uh, economic or uh, budgetary capacities uh, between the different uh, nations. And this uh, cooperation is a way also to, to, to support, to help uh, other nations to, to acquire the necessary level to, uh, to, to uh, have the positive benefits from uh, from this. I don't know if I answer your question, but this is my on the spot uh, answer. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I think, well, I, I mentioned one of the examples of, of the good practices that I think I have experienced this year about collaboration, regional collaboration. There was a month ago this uh, workshop uh, that was focused on um, several questions that are discussed actually here today in a global manner, but focus on how Latin American states see it. So the, uh, during that workshop, discussions were held about how or why space security is relevant for Latin America, or uh, what are their recommendations from the region regarding norms, rules, and principles of responsible behavior, as well as what is the international law applicable considering their international legal obligations. So having those discussions at the regional level, um, going back a little bit to what you said before about this idea of getting consensus on certain issues at, at, at a regional level to then inform the international um, negotiations could be already a good practice that is happening in some uh, regions of, of the world. And I also would like maybe to mention that in another topic that we consider a new challenge for IHL as outer space in the region for nine, nine months since the beginning of the year, we have had uh, different initiatives. And I don't want to to highlight the topic, I want to highlight maybe the process that is going on that maybe could be replicated here. We have found two communiques on the issue, one that was about with Latin American and Caribbean states, another one that was for CARICOM states. Then we had a resolution at the Latin American Parliament. We had a paragraph at the resolution of the Amer Organization of American States uh, General Assembly. Then we have a statement of head of government uh, of Latin American uh, states. So these type of statements and resolutions and political um, yeah, documents can support in this effort of getting uh, regions closer to an understanding of each of the topics, generating certain um, common positions that could help advance international processes. And, uh, and uh, this touch upon what was said before by uh, the, the panelists that each of the regions have their uh, diversities. They, they, are, they are vast regions, some of them. They have many countries in there and there are differences uh, in the capabilities that each of these countries have, but they could reach out certain common grounds of concern. And it was very interesting to see during uh, the workshop in Buenos Aires that there was some type of common agreement on, on certain issues. And I, I, I think this was a, a very good practice to, to highlight. Thanks. Thank you very much. Then uh, the, the topics that we can refer to uh, regarding these issues are indeed numerous. And it is very interesting to listening to you connecting uh, the different dots and show how this can be also relevant for space security. Now I will ask the panelists online if they have um, anything to add, maybe Andre or Noel, if you want to unmute yourself. Thank you. Yes, I would just like to add that I agree that uh, interregional different regions with different space capabilities should work together to, to find a common ground, common strategy, because more or less those in the same region have the same situation, same interest, and maybe same challenges. I would like to highlight uh, in, the, in our region, uh, there is an upcoming Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum coming up next week, and it has been an effective platform for the countries 
to be able to learn together, to present programs, and then also a platform for cooperation so that together we can build on our experiences by sharing and then knowledge coming also from our cooperation from countries that we cooperate with. And us in the Philippine Space Agency, we have been very fortunate also to, to have gained so much knowledge from partnerships with other counterparts. And we are supportive of future partnerships in the future, and we will continue to use them as a tool to achieve our common aspirations in space. Thank you. Thank you. And indeed, I haven't mentioned it, but the role of partnerships is very essential. André, do you have some points to make on these questions? No, I cannot uh, agree more than um, uh, partnership and cooperation is critical um, to um, foster um, this uh, interregional collaborations and ensuring that space security uh, are comprehensive and uh, uh, taking into consideration in, in every region. For the African case, for instance, uh, the increasing number of African countries involved in space activity uh, has em emphasized this uh, uh, need for effective diplomatic effort and, and, and international partnership. Uh, uh, to not only promote a continental collaboration uh, in space, but also to develop some sub-regional building block on, on, on space in, 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 in Africa. And building partnership based on comparative advantage and pooling resources, uh, we have seen that uh, it has a, a very critical impact on African space uh, development because support from partners such as ESA, uh, we have just mentioned that, even NASA, uh, CBERS, uh, JAXA, and other uh, key players have led to uh, a, a kind of uh, explosion of uh, interest in Africa for uh, space. And uh, this lead to the creation by the African Union of the African Space Agency. And building upon the convening power of uh, this regional space block, it will be, it, it's possible now to act uh, resolutely and decisively in, in announcing uh, regional security progress and even stability in, in, in space uh, activity in, in, in Africa. So I agree with uh, all of the other panelists that uh, partnership is, and collaboration is key, uh, really, in, in terms of ensuring that uh, we have an effective um, development of space and, and benefit for all at uh, continental, sub-regional, and even national level. Over, thank you to you. Thank you so much for this uh, answer. And uh, I will uh, go now to the next question, which is how can we ensure that the perspectives of emerging space faring nations are given equal weight in the dialogue surrounding powers? Um, André or, or Noel, if you want to uh, take the floor on this. Mm -hmm. Yes, André? Yes, OK. Um... I I will have I will start from giving a, a, a global perspective. Then I will I will I will share my 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 view specifically uh, from from the African uh, perspective. Uh, I believe that um, uh, first of all, um, if we agree that law is reason, then even uh, the African nation who are started developing their uh, uh, space programs and uh, operation have the responsibility to comply with uh, what exists at the international level, applicable provisions, um, and my accept to fulfill their obligations and uh, and duty in the international space law and 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 and, and treaties. So. Um, 
from a global point of view, I believe also that uh, uh, some of the engagement models with Africa uh, to ensure that they are all part of the, the global process uh, do need to acknowledge the work that uh, Africans are already doing to promote uh, space, uh, security, and overall peace on the, on the continent. And part of the sustainable uh, space security process in Africa will involve getting Africans to, to own the process of thinking about and then building local institutions that can provide uh, the innovative solutions and ensuring that uh, uh, government at national level are accountable uh, when they are uh, when they start developing national space uh, program but overall uh, to respond specifically to this question we need to ensure that uh, we strengthen the african contribution to the global governance of outer space activity and of course uh, is one of the um, the area where we we foster or we promote uh, the idea that more African country should become active members of the Committee on Peaceful Use of uh, Outer Space is not yet there. And this might be one of the key area where we ensure that uh, uh, we have a full participation of uh, our uh, continent in, in, in the global process. Uh, there should also be an increased active participation of African groups in the work of the committee. Uh, and some of the African global organizations, such as the African Union Commission, might be taken into consideration as permanent observer within the, the, the QPOS. That will foster the African common interest in international cooperation in the peaceful use of uh, outer space uh, and, and, and ensuring uh, space security for, for, for us. So in a nutshell, my point is that we need more involvement uh, of uh, African uh, component in the global governance of uh, outer space activity. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, and indeed, uh, when we follow the news, we, we can see how uh, impressive the, the development of the space industry is within the continent, but also beyond, uh, and how it involves a lot of international collaborations. Noel, did you want to answer this question? I believe that the recent OEWG and similar discussions like that was very effective in uh, getting the perspectives of emerging space-faring nations, and I would encourage similar platforms like that. Uh, in terms of also encouraging the space, the smaller or the the emerging space-capable nations to also join the dialogue, we should also be capacitating them or giving them more confidence to join the, the dialogue. An example would be the program of the UN USA of the Space Law for New Space Actors program. In our case, it has been very effective. That program has, um, has brought to us experts on space law, space policy, and other technical experts to build our capacity so that we are able also to advance our policy frameworks that will also give us more confidence to join to join the dialogue and the discussion. And um, I would say, let's continue this process. Let's continue having this open, open discussions so that we are able to learn from each other and we are able to share our interests and give, give also due regard to the interests of other states. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you want to add some points, Pascal? Thanks, uh, Leticia. I'm not very familiar with the PAROS uh, process, but I would like to react maybe with uh, 
uh, naive or uh, basic uh, uh, opinion, uh, saying that first, uh, what is important is the association of uh, emerging uh, space-faring uh, nations, because of course we are stronger together than being uh, isolated. This is for me the, the first and uh, obvious point. Uh, a second point is the fact that I, I mentioned at the, the beginning that we have this trend of uh, national space law. And for me, uh, it's important to promote uh, international law. That means uh, uh, at that international level, each nation has, in principle, the same weight around the, around the table. And the third point I would like to, to add is, uh, again, uh, cooperation uh, for, uh, um, I would say, trust building for transparency. Uh, this is also another way uh, around the table, the same table or another table to have the, the, same, the same way. Uh, the same voice uh, for, for each. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, yes, I really like the fact that you mentioned this importance of having the, the same voice because the, the next question is particularly dear to me. Inclusivity, including gender discussions, they play a pivotal role in alienating the power of privileges and opportunities accessible to certain individuals and denied to others within societies. And as I said earlier, the, the factors such as our geographical locations, age, gender, and other personal facets, they profoundly influence our journey towards achieving equality and evading you know, prejudices among the different people. And therefore, recognizing the nuances of gender is imperative as well. At UNIDIR, for instance, our gender program is working on related matters under the lead of my colleague, Renata Delacroix, who develops analysis and practical tools and they contribute to gender equality in disarmament fora and promote the effective integration of gender perspectives into arms control processes. And I also have to mention organizations like uh, CIPRI, Project Plowshare, many others. And the question is the following, and I will let the panelists take the floor uh, in the room or, or virtually. How could the woman peace and security agenda be applied to international instruments regarding space security? Are there parallel cases from other fields that you think space security could grow from? The making of international regulations is the task of sovereign states. So how do we include uh, citizens' participation, especially for minorities and diverse groups, in the process of improving security? Romina, you have the floor. Thank you. So uh, regarding the, the Women, Peace and Security Resolution uh, at the ICRC, uh, we have seen that, especially the protection pillar, that calls states to apply uh, obligations of IHL to protect uh, women and girls in armed conflict uh, could be read as well. And, and we are actually encouraging states to include a gender perspective into the application of these obligations of IHL. And, and this would uh, aim at ensuring the protection of women and girls as well as um, minimizing the inequalities. And, and taking into account these inequalities. We are actually going to launch in November a, a report about IHL and the gender perspective in uh, military operations that I think could inform somehow this process of negotiations that you might be having in the future. But also you, you ask about two of the, of the examples that we could bring uh, for, for this discussion in particular. And as, as we mentioned it before, I, I brought here two examples that are not related necessarily to the space uh, security discussions, but are recent examples of how this gender perspective was included. One was with the WIPA declaration, so the explosive weapons in populated areas that was adopted uh, last year in November which preamble recognizes the importance of efforts to record and track civilian casualties and the use of all practicable measures to ensure appropriate data collection, including, where feasible, data disaggregated by sex and age. So we already have something uh, included in there. The second example, um, oh, sorry, and it also welcomes uh, the work and the encourage the research uh, into gender impacts of the use of explosive weapons in its uh, paragraph 1.10. The second example is the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in its Article 6.1, integrates also the gender uh, perspective into the issue of victim assistance, uh, saying that each state party shall 
um, in accordance with applicable international humanitarian and human rights law, adequately provide age and gender sensitive assistance. Uh, so this in the article and then in the preamble also recognize the disproportionate impact uh, of on women and girls, including the results of ionizing radiation. So these are two examples that could be brought into the discussion on how the international community is already including the gender perspective in a political declaration and in a binding treaty. Thank you very much for this remark. So I will take some questions from the room and take some questions from the Q&A from our online audience. So how are we monitoring uh, the intersections of space security and human security in examining global space expansion? If we not, how can we start or how do we start the discussion in reference to space justice? Is there a current framework available? Thank you. To react on this uh, cyber uh, cyber aspect and uh, cyber security uh, in particular, and to give this uh, to give the ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, uh, views. Uh, also, of course, we we take uh, very seriously this uh, cyber uh, aspect in, in the the development, the design of capacities, the space capacities. Uh, we, uh, we we speak about the security by design now when we develop uh, uh, new new systems uh, ESA is uh, at the moment uh, uh, setting up a dedicated entity uh, an operations a cyber operation center and also uh, a cyber excellence center the operation center is uh, taking care of the uh, the different uh, uh, cyber attacks we can uh, uh, detect, identify, and to be in a position to react in, uh, in due time. And uh, the Cyber Excellence Center is to uh, develop uh, knowledge uh, about uh, cyber uh, world, and uh, in particular linked to the, 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 uh, the, space, uh, the space activities. Uh, it's uh, my technical uh, answer concerning this, this point. Uh, the other question was about uh, space uh, security and human security. Uh, is, would it be possible just to, to <laughs> repeat the question? So um, it's about monitoring the intersection of uh, space security and uh, human security in examining the uh, global space expansion. So it's about, you know, like uh, justice and uh, these uh, different notions that can apply to the different sectors. Yes. Yes, it's a difficult question. Uh, perhaps to say that uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, when we consider what we are doing uh, in uh, on Earth, uh, the terrestrial uh, activities, uh, uh, the, the the low uh, dimension of uh, what we do uh, on Earth. Uh, the question is how to translate uh, this uh, uh, context into uh, outer space uh, also. Uh, and just to, to, uh, to say that uh, uh, concerning uh, an aggression, I'm not, I'm not sure that it's linked to the question, but this is my reaction. Uh, how is it possible to, to characterize an aggression in, uh, in outer space, in space? Uh, an aggression, by definition, it's uh, the use of uh, of a weapon. There is this other question: What is a weapon in in um, in space? Uh, we don't know exactly today. Uh, a debris is it a weapon? Uh, uh, a satellite uh, hitting another satellite is it uh, uh, also a, a weapon by destination? Uh, this is a, another another point. And behind, we have also this uh, intentional intentionality. Uh, is it uh, voluntary or not? Uh, a debris uh, eating a satellite, is it something intentional or just an accident? Uh, also, this uh, issue to identify the author, the author of this, uh, of this hostile act. This is also another point. It's very difficult sometimes to identify the authors of uh, hostile uh, act. And uh, uh, on Earth, we have also this notion of territory. Uh, in space, by definition, with the space treaty, we have uh, non-appropriation. That means no territory uh, in space. This is also uh, another aspect to, to consider. And finally, also comparing uh, space on Earth, we have uh, uh, at the moment not a permanent population in space. 
we have astronauts in the International Space Station, etc. But it's not uh, uh, today uh, a strong population in in, uh, in orbit. Uh, also to to compare, with. so the context is complicated. Uh, it's my comparison between space security and human security. This is my uh, my reaction. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Maybe. Uh taking into consideration what Pascal just mentioned uh, re regarding cyber and looking at it in from the perspective of IHL, this is one of the issues that we consider that present some challenges in, in outer space. And they are in discussion, not only in this framework, but also in other frameworks at the, at the UN regarding what really constitute an attack. Uh, regarding civilian, uh, sorry, uh, cyber operations. And of course, a kinetic uh, operation against a space object uh, for us would constitute, constitute an attack, but disabling this space object through a cyber attack for some states might not be the case. It might not constitute an attack. It might not, some laws or international humanitarian law might not be applicable. So this is exactly one of the examples that I was, uh, that that um, brings a little bit into the reality, my, my words from before of saying, we think as ICRC that IHL uh, applies to outer space when applicable, when there is an armed conflict, but there, is, there are some um, elements that the international community, the states need to decide on how it would apply to this specific reality. And regarding the second question, I, I'm not so sure if I understood it correctly, but linking this um, idea of cyber security, uh, sorry, of space security with uh, civilian security, and, and especially considering our humanitarian mandate, we have uh, given to states five recommendations on how they can uh, conduct or how they can conduct their space activities, uh, minimizing the risk that those activities can pose to the civilian uh, population. And one of them is, of course, refrain from conducting or supporting any military operation that will disrupt, destroy, physically damage, or other ways the disable space systems necessary for the provision of essential civilian services. And I know that I have mentioned this many times, but for us it's fundamental that we take this humanitarian perspective into account. The second one is whatever is feasible, because I have heard many presenters before about the, the difficulties of really separating space systems and having a military and a civilian system. I think that was a panel before that was explaining specifically about registration of this system. And this is another recommendation to identify, mark, register, uh, or indicate these space systems, and especially mark those that are fundamental for humanitarian activities, or even those that uh, directly source activities that are protected under international humanitarian law. For example, it could be medical activities. So these are some of the examples of uh, actions that can be taken at the space um, activity that could uh, have an impact on the um, civilians' security on Earth. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing us these perspectives, Ms. Castillo. Yes, thank you. I would just like to add that the, that the applicability of the IHL, International Humanitarian Law, was also discussed in the, in the recently concluded OEWG on reducing space threats. And I do agree that it is a subject matter that we need to discuss further, and we welcome the discussion on that. And it does have merit that it also applies to outer space. And also, as I mentioned, uh, as an emerging spacefaring, na space capable nation, our interest is also protecting or securing our space, space limited space assets. And, uh, and that would include also securing it from cyber attacks that, that uh, would also disrupt our national, national territorial or citizens sense of security. Thank you. Thank you so much for these views. André? Yeah, just a quick one on the cyber security side. Uh, collaboration and, 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 and working together is key in, 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 in handling or in um, tackling uh, such a, a, a challenge. And I believe that um, um, not, uh, my, state or nation can learn from the agile ability of the 
uh, NG3 and TT um, in promoting their national expertise or capacity in, 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 in this field uh, of uh, cyber security that I believe will ensure that we we develop the security for 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 all so we need to to work hand in hands in in tackling this kind of uh, this kind of challenge uh, has the nexus issue between um earth security civilian security and uh, uh space security i we all know this uh, quote from uh, socrates that man should go above the earth and then it can see how best it can manage what is happening uh, on the on the ground on earth but uh i have the feeling that uh, we are still in the uh, competition or competing for power mood even in the in the space whereas we should leverage on the enabling capability of uh, space science and technology to solve some of the problem we have on 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 earth and and maybe as uh, the previous speaker has said we need to to set up or to enhance the dialogue so that we can uh, ensure that uh, space has a benefit in terms of uh, helping us to solve uh day-to-day -day problems on on earth with that i believe that we can see a concrete linkages between uh security on the space and security on earth thank you over to you thank you very much and i will ask uh, for one minute conclusion from uh, each of you to close the discussion so you have the floor Thank you very much. I think I already spoke a lot, but I just wanted to first thank again Unidir for, for this important session. I think it is very good to see in a program the discussions about uh, inclusivity, diversity, and how the regional, like the different regional perspective can be integrated into international negotiations. Um, as ICRC, of course, I cannot say uh, goodbye be before saying that um, we consider that the humanitarian considerations should be a cornerstone in any multilateral, whether it is international or regional negotiation. And, and we hope that the, the messages and the uh, different papers and recommendations that we have produced can support this uh, work that the national uh, space agencies, but also the companies as well as the authorities are doing in order to protect and, and prevent these damages to civilian populations. Thank you very much. Again, thank you so much for this uh, invitation. So the, the subject matter of this uh, panel was uh, a vast one, and it, it was, of, of course, impossible to cover all, uh, all aspects. But for me, the, the important uh, point is the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the aim we have is to avoid uh, any tension uh, we, which could uh, justify the, the deployment of weapons in outer space uh, through uh, dialogue, uh, cooperation, and transparency again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Again, I would like to thank you, Nidir, for having me at this, at this discussion. And uh, we, I think, we have affirmed tonight that although we have, we are, we are of diverse backgrounds, national, national interests, but we have common aspirations in space security, and uh, the role of each one, and the voice of each one, and the perspective of each one is is vital so that we are able to move forward with achieving long term uh, with uh, long term sustainability of outer space uh, activity uh, guidelines i mean implementation and i look forward to having more of these discussions and thank you and good evening to all we uh, also appreciate and i'm grateful for the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, on 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 this panel uh, from what i'm seeing I believe that uh, one takeaway point is how do we continue to empower uh, some of the key stakeholders that might be the youth and uh, uh, some of the um, disadvantaged groups like women uh, in the science and technology culture through hands-on experience. Um, in the creation of example of space system uh, 
at uh, at all level, uh, particularly in, in in Africa, this should be one of the main priority uh, of uh, emerging African uh, space nation, and and uh, EDA will be a space agency or similar institutions uh, in order for us to continue to foster the uptake of uh, space technology and it's related uh, security for, for, for all. I also look forward to have this kind of dialogue and conversation with the African Space Agency, National Space Agency at the regional level so that we can uh, tackle some of the uh, issues that are particular to our region. And uh, thank you so much for uh, putting this in place and uh, uh, we appreciate, thank you. Thank you. And I'm truly elated that we could share this insights with all present here and those joining us virtually.